So welcome, everybody, to the last class with any content in this course. The final class will be on Thursday, and we're just going to do review. So we'll just review stuff from across the course in preparation for the exam and do one uh, novel argument analysis just so that you get a little bit more practice on that. Uh, so this is the last class with anything you actually have to learn. So we just about made it. Thanks, everyone, for hanging through the cognition and mental health week. I found that very difficult to give those lectures. It might have been difficult to listen to. Um, fortunately, on last Tuesday, I had my, my mom and my cousin visited for moral support, so that was nice. If you saw two students, one of whom seemed too old and one too young to be in this room, that was, that was my mom and my, my little nephew. Sorry, not my cousin, my nephew. So anyway. OK, a uh, couple of course things. So argument analysis 2, I've extended the deadline from the 30th to December 3rd. So that's midnight December 3rd, the end of December 3rd. Again, feel free to hand it in on the regular due date if you prefer. But uh, the exam schedule, no problem. Exam schedule has been posted, and it's fairly late. We have a fairly late exam, so I, it w we won't be too bunched up here. So I thought we could maybe use an extra weekend. I hope this doesn't ruin your weekend. But uh, so that's the new due date. Same procedure. Same way of handing it in. Uh, so I believe all of the argument analysis, including the late ones, are now posted on uh, the UTOR submit. So if you want to look at your uh, results there. And if you want to ask questions about those results, get in, get in touch with me. I understand one of the TAs generously offered uh, that you could email him to get feedback, uh, but they have no hours. So TAs are given very specific amounts of time that they're paid to do very specific tasks. And there's no hours for them to give you feedback on this stuff, just to mark it. So talk to me. I'm very happy to discuss any part of it with you. OK? Uh, and the exam. So the exam is Saturday, sorry, uh, December 16th, 5 to 7 PM, IB 110. Yeah? So we'll see you then and there. That's posted on uh, the UCM website. Uh, there'll be 50 points in total. And the structure will be slightly different than the first two tests, uh, especially since we can't argue about the multiple choice questions on the exam because the class will be over. I thought short answer was a better format, a fairer format, easier to get part marks, uh, and that kind of thing. So it will be 15 short answer questions worth two points each, and then an argument analysis. And that's it. Uh, and again, uh, paper dictionaries, including translation dictionaries. So if you have a one language to English dictionary that you want to bring, that's, you're welcome to do that. No other aids are allowed, no cheat sheets or anything like that. And the exam is cumulative, so it covers all of the course. We haven't done all that much since test two, really. So it, it would be weird to just do like cognition and mental health and paradoxes and make that the whole exam. Yeah? Uh, so. Here are some examples of the structure of the short answer question. So I wrote a, a whole bunch of short answer questions, and here are some leftovers. These, these aren't on the exam, but they are very similar to the ones that will be on the exam. And I'll, I'll, on Thursday, I want to take up with you what I would consider ideal answers to these. I just want to show you these off the bat. So uh, explain the concept of soundness. That's worth two points. And to explain it, you say what it is, and then maybe relate it to one other concept in the course. Uh, Explain the difference between descriptive and normative claims. Like, these are, I hope that what I focused on are central concepts from the course. And they're concepts that were found on the list of key terms for the first and second test. And I'll generate for you another list of key terms for the remainder of the course. Okay, so I've, dr I've drawn all of the short answer questions from those lists of key terms. If you're able to explain all of those key terms, you should do excellently on this exam. Yeah? I really, really don't want to throw you curveballs or surprises. I want to make this so that if you've been here and you've been studying and paying attention and absorbing the material, that you will do very well on this exam. Yeah? And I'll count on enough people taking this class credit, no credit, to give us a reasonable average. Uh, so if you feel like not studying, that's fine. You can help me give a more reasonable distribution. Uh, but for those of you who are actually trying to do well in this class, I want for you to do very well. So there's that. OK. And for the argument analysis, here is the exact prompt that I'll It's not the argument that I'm going to give you, but here's the exact prompt that I'll give you. Nothing in this should be surprising or unfamiliar. So analyze the following argument, identify its conclusion, premises, missing premises, and structure. 
and assess the acceptability of its premises, the relevance, overall adequacy of the argument. If you don't know the truth of the premise, indicate how you go about checking it. Finally, consider one counter argument. It's, it's exactly the same instructions as the two argument analyses. Obviously, because you only have a little while to work on this, you're not gonna, we're, our standards are not going to be as high as on the ones that you've had weeks to work on. So we're certainly not expecting this to be up to the standards of the two argument analyses. It's much shorter. It's a paragraph or so. So uh, you should be well prepared for this question. And just to give you a little bit of like, you know, insight into what the content of the argument will be, it's about human cloning. So if you've never heard of human cloning, maybe look it up on Google. Uh, and it involves a reference to Kant's categorical imperative, which I did talk about in this class. So if you, if you totally blank on what that means, it does explain what they think it means in the argument, but maybe look it up just in case. Not much hangs on that, on understanding those things, because you're just analyzing the argument, not like digging into the, the deep structure of Kant's philosophy or anything like that. But just as a heads up, I don't want you to get caught up on the content of these ideas. I want you to be focusing on the structure. OK? OK. So if there's not any other questions about course stuff, we'll do paradoxes. I'll do paradoxes because I thought it would be fun and light and not that, not that emotionally wrenching at this stressful time. Although it's a lovely day outside, isn't it? It's gorgeous out there. I'm kind of sad to be having you sit inside, but I, there's no projector outside, so we'll, we have to stay here. OK, so a paradox is a statement that seems that we must judge both true and false. Right? So for that to be the case, there has to be what looks like a deductively valid or at least inductively strong argument for the truth of the statement and a different argument for its falseness. Right? And distinguish that from just a plain old contradiction. So if I say it's raining and it's not raining, that's not a paradox. It's just a contradiction. Uh, and you should judge that sentence to be just false, right? There's no reason to believe that it's both true and false. It's just false. So if you see something that's straight up contradictory, that's not a paradox. It's a paradox when it looks like there's a good argument on both sides of the true and false, and that you have to accept both sides. Uh, so that's what makes a paradox a paradox. And we're just going to go through this class. We're just going to go through some classic examples of paradoxes and talk about them, talk about how we might resolve them. So you do want to resolve paradoxes if you want to preserve the kind of structure of rationality. And here's kind of why. So uh, it's because anything follows from a true contradiction. So if you have a contradiction, this is true and it's false. <laughs> and you have to, and you can't, you can't claim that that contradiction is false. Here's what you can do with that. So if you have a true contradiction, you say that P and not P are both true. You can always add in logic, if you have P, you can always infer from that P or Q, right? So if I know that it's sunny, then I know that it's sunny or leprechauns exist. That's logically speaking, that is a perfectly valid inference. You can do that in a logical proof. Okay, so P or Q follows from P and Q follows from P or Q and not P, right? So if I say it's sunny or leprechauns exist, leprechauns don't exist, therefore it's sunny. That's just a good old fashioned disjunctive syllogism. That's a perfectly, also a perfectly valid move in logic. You can do this in a logical proof. So therefore from P and not P, you can derive any Q you want. So Q, I haven't said what Q is here, or P, but uh, because you can do from P or Q and the other half of the contradiction, you can get Q, which means that from P or and not P, you can derive literally anything. And that's bad, right? You don't want to be able to validly infer any random nonsense because you want your inferences to track reality in, in some important way, right? So this is called the principle of explosion. It's what happens if you accept a contradiction to be true. So that's bad, right? You want to not have this be the case. Uh, and therefore, you should want, you should be at least motivated. If you find this disturbing at all, and I think you should find it at least somewhat disturbing, you should want to resolve any paradox that you're presented with. You should want to say, 
P and not P isn't true after all. Something must have been wrong with one side of the argument or the other, or both. Yeah? So it's my re epistemic recommendation to you. If you're faced with a paradox, probably you should try to unravel it somehow, or else you're faced with this explosion problem. OK. So that's the problem. Let's just look at some paradoxes. Ooh, that's badly assembled. All right, so this is supposed to say paradoxes of common sense. So some arguments seem paradoxical because they have conclusions which violate common sense assumptions. So you've got an argument for one conclusion, common sense says the opposite, and therefore there's a reason to believe the opposite because there's common sense, and there's a reason to believe the conclusion because you've got an argument for it, therefore you've got a kind of paradox. Uh, if you're willing to give up the common sense assumption because you've got such a good argument, then that's one way out of such a paradox, right? You say, well, it turns out common sense is wrong. Usually you're not really excited to do that. You don't want to like just toss out things that you totally assume to be true just because somebody gave you a, an argument, but it is a way out of this kind of thing. So paradoxes of common sense, you can either give up the common sense belief or you can find a problem in the argument that was supposed to contradict common sense. So let's look at some. So this is the classic paradox. This is where uh, like philosophy started around here, not, not far before or after here. The Western tradition of philosophy at least started here. This, this by the way, is the only paradox I'm going to specifically ask you about on the exam. There might be a question about paradoxes in general. This is the only one that's actually specifically on the exam. So I probably shouldn't have put it first and told you that because you're going to tune out for the rest of the thing, but nonetheless. Uh, okay, so here's Zeno's paradox of motion. Achilles and a tortoise are running a race. You can, can you see Achilles? So Achilles is represented by the Trojan condom symbol here, and uh, the tortoise is that uh, little oval there. So Achilles, and Achilles, who is famously fast, that's the thing he's possibly not most famous for, but amongst the things that he's famous for is that he's very, very fast. Tortoises, notoriously slow. So they're running a race against each other, and Achilles gives the tortoise a big head start. He starts them halfway down the race, right? So they start at the same time, and off they go. And when Achilles reaches the point where the tortoise started, of course, the tortoise hasn't gone very far, but he's got some non-zero distance, right? And then, OK, so Achilles still has to catch up. So he goes that distance, and of course, the tortoise has moved some non-zero distance again. So Achilles still needs to catch up and so on and so forth, right? So every time Achilles reaches the point where he, the tortoise was, the tortoise has moved ahead a little bit, and so he has to catch up, and so every time he catches up to where it was, the tortoise has moved again, on to infinity. Therefore, Zeno seriously wants to conclude motion is impossible. So he's got a series of these paradoxes, and the point was to prove to the world uh, following his, I think it was mentor Parmenides, who claimed that all change is merely an illusion, and in fact, the world is perfectly static. So the fact that you think things change is just your, your faulty human senses deceiving you, and here's the proof. Right? So the common sense thing is things change. The argument is Achilles cannot catch up to this tortoise, therefore change is impossible. Okay. So what's the so, so I, I haven't written down the solution for this. What is the solution to this paradox? Well, how would you resolve this paradox? Would you conclude that change is impossible? I don't really recommend that strategy. You can if you want, but let's see if we can cook up something better, right? So what do you say to the argument here? You've got to come up with some way of defeating the argument from Zeno. So Zeno says, this is going to be an infinite process. And therefore, because you can't complete an infinite number of things in a finite amount of time, there's no way for Achilles to catch up and pass the tortoise. Here's a hint. Calculus helps. Anyone? Yeah. Achilles will pass the tortoise. 
Good. Okay, so that's an argument that he should he should pass it. So what do you what do you do with okay? So that sounds that sounds so plausible. You can, I bet you would never have believed that you'd have to say that out loud. But so what's the but what's the response to this infinite regress thing that, that Zeno wants you to believe? Well, one thing that you could say is that it's not impossible to do an infinite number of things in a finite amount of time. Right? If those things are infinitely small, so as just exactly as Achilles is reaching the tortoise, you might say that there is an infinite series of these, the tortoise moves forward and Achilles catches up and the tortoise moves forward and the Achilles catches up, but they get infinitely small as Achilles approaches the tortoise. Right? So against Zeno, who says you can't do an infinite number of things in a finite amount of time, one way of solving this is to say, actually, you can. You can, you can catch up an infinite number of times because the size of the things you need to catch up on get smaller and smaller to the, time, the point where they're actually zero. And then Achilles can pass the tortoise, things can change, and everything is right with the world. Yeah? I think that's the standard, standard response to this one. Yeah? OK. Uh, here's another one. Here's one from Plato, uh, Mino's paradox. So. This was Plato's argument. Again, the common, this is a uh, paradox of common sense. Common sense says you can learn stuff. Yeah? You can learn things that you didn't know before. Plato actually rejects that. Plato thinks all learning is actually just recollection. So what, before you were born, your soul was in the immaterial realm of Plato's hell, heaven, and it knew everything. Or at least it knew all the important stuff, like geometry. I think that's the only important thing for him. But. So it knew everything important. And then when you're born, you just forget it all. And then Plato says, all learning is just remembering that stuff. So that's for him the resolution of this paradox. You don't actually learn anything. Suppose you don't believe in Plato's heaven. You don't believe that you knew everything before you were born. Uh, you're faced with this argument. So here's the argument. So if you know what you're trying to learn, learning is impossible because you already know it. If you don't know what you're trying to learn, then learning is impossible because you don't know what you're looking for. Therefore, learning is impossible. Okay, so two premises and a conclusion. One says, if yes, then this. If no, the other one says, if no, then that. So you really have to, and they seem to like, if those two, that's a valid argument, right? It's a valid argument. If learning is impossible in one way, and learning is impossible in the only other way, like learning is impossible if you already know it, learning is impossible if you don't already know it, then learning is impossible. So the only strategy here is to deny one or both of these premises. Yeah? What would you say? Can you know of something but not know how to do it so you can then learn it? Good, good. I think that's perfectly reasonable. So you would say, like, uh, if you don't know what you're trying to learn, then learning is not impossible. So I, I want to learn how to drive a car. It's not that you are unaware of cars or driving or that you can learn to drive one, right? You start, you don't start from zero knowledge of the object. You start from like some knowledge and then you, you build on it. So it's an iterative process where, you know, you're learning a little bit about something. You're not learning the whole thing all at once. I think this happens in science all the time. Like uh, dark matter, for example, used to be just kind of a label for our ignorance. We're like, these measurements are not matching what they should be I guess we'll call whatever that is dark matter. Yeah. Um, like it also yeah. means like you can't learn by yourself. Like you need another Interesting. resource or like partner to teach you. Interesting. So you can't you, you can't learn by you can't just learn by like pure reflection or something like that. You can't learn in a let's I think so I think self teaching is possible, but like maybe you can't learn in a vacuum. Like yeah, so you need some by yourself would you read that strongly where it's like you need a a book or a, a tool or something to help you learn. Yeah. Yeah. I think that would also get us out of this. Yeah. Okay. Mino's paradox. This would get you out of a lot of trouble if it was true because then you wouldn't have to learn stuff anymore. Wouldn't that be great? All right. All right. Okay. So those were paradoxes of common sense. Uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of, there's millions of paradoxes. There's a ton of them. We'll just do kind of a survey of them. Uh, 
And those ones are, I felt, you know, they're not impossible to solve. They're, they're fair, not super straightforward, but they're fairly straightforward. Uh, some arguments seem to be paradoxical because uh, logic, the, you know, logic has certain limits. And when you try to fit the world into a logical framework, which you should, but when you try to do that, sometimes logic doesn't quite match. So uh, logic, for example, at least standard propositional quantifier logic, so modern symbolic logic, all the standard forms assign either completely true or completely false to any given statement. There's only two truth values, true and false. You gotta pick one, you can't have some mushy in between thing. Uh, and this generates a variety of paradoxes. So this is the, the classic Sorites paradox, uh, also called the paradox of the heap. So consider this principle. The removal of a single hair does not make a person bald. Pull out one hair, that doesn't turn you from a non-bald person to a bald person, yeah? You lose hairs all the time, like this is, this is not how you become bald. So if you remove one hair from my head, I'm not bald. So assuming I didn't start out bald. Having removed that hair, apply the same principle, right? The principle, the first, the principle from the first premise still applies. So having removed the first one, removing a second will not turn a bald person into a non-bald person and continue this process until I'm completely without hair and then I'm nonetheless still not bald. Because at no point can you say taking away one hair turns a non-bald person into a bald person. Yeah? Okay, yeah. Sorry, the what? The it's the term addition. That's what if you remove one, that's two. So it's, it's I see. One. I see. So but at every point, so you've got a series of heads with a series of amount of hair. And at every point, this principle seems plausible. Right? That the difference of one hair doesn't make it from one thing into another, right? So if you say removing 75% of somebody's hair can turn them from a uh, non-bald person to a bald person, that seems right. That, but that, you, don't get the, you don't generate the paradox that way. It's just sort of like a much more sensible principle, right? Uh, but nonetheless, it does seem sensible that for any given amount of hair, taking away one hair doesn't turn a non-bald person into a bald person. Uh, the version of this is the paradox of the heap. It says adding one grain doesn't turn something that's not a heap of sand. So, or t sorry, do it taking away. You got a heap of sand, a big heap of sand. Taking one grain away doesn't turn the heap into not a heap. Right? Seems plausible. Repeat ad infinitum, or at least until there's no more grains of sand. And at some point, you've got no more sand, but it's still a heap. That seems bad. Right? Okay, so that's the, that's the argument. What is the resolution? How would you, how would you deal with this, parado this apparent paradox? You know, you hope none of these are actually paradoxes because that would mean that rationality comes crashing down and we can't think anymore. You can't be rational anymore. So I hope that these are just look like paradoxes. Yeah. With the hair one, like, yeah. say if you remove like one hair, there's one bald spot. Okay, <laughs> uh, so. Baldness not as a property of a head, but as a property of like points on a head. Yeah, and then as you do it, yeah. Okay, okay. I don't know how it would work this way. Yeah, yeah. Um, the paradox relies on you only believing that one premise. So if we only believe that removing one hair from a head does not make you bald, then the paradox would be true. But if you add in other premises that do happen in reality, so like, as long as they're like given a restriction, like as long as there's more than one hair left on the head. <laughs> but like, okay, so yeah, okay, that's, that's, that's seems promising. But like, if you see a person with exactly one hair on their head, I would call that person bald. They're pretty bald. Like even bald people can have one hair, right? Homer Simpson's got like four and he's bald. Does seem arbitrary to pick exactly one number of hairs. Yeah. But there is a, some point where it occurs. It's just an unknown point. Okay. 
Okay, is that basically what you're going to yeah, say? Like that. Say that baldness is kind of ambiguous anyway, because uh, are you bald if only the top of your head right, has no hair, or right. do you have to have like no hair at all? Right. Good. I think actually you're making two different points here. So you seem to be suggesting that there is a definite point in which, so I've got like some number of hairs, 3,000 hairs, and that if you pull one out, I'm not bald. If you pull two out, I'm not bald. But if you pull out 2,564, then I go from being not bald to being bald. Possibly. Possibly. There is possibly some point. Yeah. But it seems more like with this, it's more of a vague area. Good. Okay. So this is the, and this, you were saying it's more like it's a vague thing. So the question here is, do you want to preserve the principle that a property always either definitely applies or definitely doesn't apply, right? So if you need, if you need for properties to have not vague boundaries, then you need to do something like a person with 2,347 hairs is not bald and a person with 2,346 hairs is bald because that gives the property definite applicability. Right? And that's what we want to do in logic. You want to have all of your properties that either, you know, if you say this person has this property, you need to be able to assign it either true or false. There's no mushy middle ground in formal logic, at least. I mean, most systems of formal logic. But if we're, I mean, like, I don't think anybody uses language like that. We certainly don't, like, it would be weird for that number to be somehow contained in the concept of baldness and just nobody knows it. So where did that number come from? How did it get generated? The alternative is to give up on this idea that predicates must either definitely apply or definitely don't apply. The, the alternative is to say, well, there are people who are balding. You're half bald. So is this person bald or not bald? Eh, they're half. So if you ask, is it true that this person's bald? You have to say something like kinda or sorta or mostly. There are systems of logic that allow that, fuzzy logic, so you can assign a truth value between true and false. This is like 75% true. Uh, it's a little more sophisticated and less sort of intuitive, but that's the kind of, so those are the two strategies you can use to deal with this. You can say either there's a hidden exact point where the predicate stops applying, or you can accept that not all predicates have exact extension. So the extension is the thing that are things that fall under the predicate. And you can say there are some things that kind of fall under it and some things that don't. So this is, I mean, probably you don't have a lot of problems in your life that result from this style of paradox because you're probably fairly happy to accept that concepts have vague boundaries, right? Most, most concepts don't have an exceptionally, well, we talked about this in the definition section. Most concepts don't have such well-defined properties that you can say exactly and only what things fall under it. And Baldness and being a heap, so it's like five grains of sand a heap, well, kind of not, is 150? Yeah, maybe a little, right? So it depends, your response to the style of paradox depends very much on how attached you are to the idea that you always need to be able to say that something is completely true or completely false. Logicians tend to be very attached to that idea. Uh, normal humans, less so. Normal humans, they're humans, they're just, a very odd variety. Okay, uh, another classic one. Did you want to say more about the, okay. Another classic one, uh, the ship of Theseus. This is, uh, these are, a lot of these are from ancient Greek philosophy. So this is another one from ancient Greek philosophy. So here's the, here's the principle. Replacing one board on a ship, suppose the ship is made of wood, does not make it a totally new ship. So if, you, if one board is rotten, you pull it out, you put in a new one, you don't have a new ship, right? Same ship. Same ship. Now, imagine you've had this ship for a really long time and you replace each board one at a time, slowly but surely. So if the first thing that we said was true, that replacing one board doesn't make it a new ship, that means this continues to be the same ship throughout this process, even after you've replaced all of the boards. Same ship. Now, suppose that you've been saving all those boards in your garage or whatever, and you put, use them to put together a, a, a ship. Now you got two ships, both of which are the ship of Theseus. Supposedly it was Theseus's ship. So which one is the ship? So this is, yeah? This is a paradox about identity through change. Mm. So you call the part, like for example, if there's a watch, yep. you call a part of the watch. 
Right? Sure. So if you have board of the ship, that's not the ship. That's the part of the ship. I think that's I think that's okay. Even you can you can accept that and still get to the get to the paradox, right? So nobody they don't think that the boards are the ship as a whole. There are, it's okay to call them just parts of the ship. It's the question of identity here. So is it having replaced one board, is it the same ship? And most people are willing to say, yeah, it's, it's the same ship. And then having completely reassembled, so at the end, you've got two whole ships, two whole objects. Yeah? And then which one is the ship of Theseus? Or are they both the ship of Theseus? That seems weird too, right? Certainly not. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. So the the yeah the idea is that uh, yeah so the new ship is the ship of Theseus. The old ship is probably a much crummier ship that you built from rotten boards or whatever. Uh, it's not the ship of Theseus. Good, good. That's one way. I think that's one way of dealing with this. Yeah. Uh, notice that you have the exact same problem about the molecules in your body, because the molecules you have now weren't with you seven years ago, and they won't be with you seven years from now. So, like, if somebody collected up all of the skin flakes that fell off of you and put them together in a new person, would that be you? Yeah. I think in the same vein. Yeah. Uh, Good. And yep. then the new piece like replaces it almost. Yep. Yep. So then you have a pile of unassociated pieces. When you build it, it becomes associated with its own ship, I guess. Yep. Yep. Then Good. You'd have to rename it anyway. You can't. You can't double name. Yeah. 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 Good. Good. We're, really, we're reasonably satisfied with that. So this is a paradox of identity. And the question is, so the problem here is, I think this, this apparent paradox is generated by the fact that identity conditions are also kind of vague. If you, t if you say two things are the same thing, you can tolerate a little bit of difference between them, right? So I'm the same person I was this morning, despite the fact that I've lost some molecules and I've gained some molecules. I'm the same guy. I'm the same person. I have the same driver's license, right? Uh, all that stuff. I'm going to go home to the same place. So identity seems to tolerate small changes in composition, uh, and that's a that's a violation of kind of, of deep logical principles actually. So if you say the principle of the identity, uh, the indiscernibility of identicals, if you say if two things are identical, that they share all of their properties in common. Right? This is a standard logical principle. And turns out, well, not really. When we, when we try to assign actual identities to actual objects, we're willing to tolerate some differences in the properties and still say that's the same ship. And then you just sort of take that, take that little bit of toleration that people are willing to, to like allow differences and still call it identical and just iterate it over and over again and you get these extreme cases. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if I see the ship, for example, I'm a observer, for example. Yeah. And if you change just one board of the ship, I'll be like, yeah, that's the same ship. Yeah. And if I don't see the whole complete change of the whole ship, right. Okay, okay, so good. The identity is resembled with the old words, not the new ones. Interesting, interesting. I think you, so you set that up by sort of limiting which parts of it you get to see, yeah? So uh, it could be the case that we assign identity based on what we know about the, about the system, right? So we say this is identical because blah, blah, blah. And there could be various ways of assigning, assigning identity. And if you have information about one way, you're going to be like, yeah, no, I, I recognize that board. That's the board from the, the ship. So that's the ship of Theseus kind of thing. And you, it might be the case that if you put different amounts of weight on the different ways we assign identity, you'll come up with two different answers. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So with that one, can you also, like, if we were to translate it to, like, people? People. Like, if you used to know someone and they were a certain way. Yeah. 
Yeah. And they change completely. Yeah. So then you would say, like, of course, like you're not the same person they used to know, but in the core they still are the same person. Change. Yeah. I mean, certainly they still have a continuity of identity. So if you followed them around the whole time, so this is interesting. So if you have this big gap and you see all these changes, you're like, you're not the man I used to know. But if you'd followed them around the whole time, those changes would have been small enough to be like, yeah, you shouldn't dye your hair like that, but I'm, you're still the same guy or whatever. You shouldn't listen to 90s rap metal, but God, you're still the same guy. You know, like whatever, whatever horrible changes this person has gone through. So, okay, there's a few more to get, get through. Let's, let's do this. So uh, some things seem paradoxical because you don't want to accept the conclusion, but nonetheless, you should accept the conclusion. So let's look at a couple of those. Uh, here's Hilbert's Hotel. There's a lot of things that uh, happen with infinity. Has anybody seen Hilbert's Hotel before? Do they do this in like math classes and stuff? Okay, good. At least one. Good. Okay, so imagine a hotel with an infinite number of rooms, countably infinite, of course, uh, all of which are occupied. The, the place is completely full. It's, they're doing great business somehow. Uh, but a VIP arrives and needs a room. They can be accommodated, despite the fact that all of the rooms are full by asking everybody to move one room over. The place was completely full. There were no empty rooms. But you can get another person in there by saying, okay, everybody in room, if you're in room two, go to room three. If you're in room three, go to room four. If you're going to five. You can also do this with an infinite number of people, a countably infinite number of people, by saying to everybody, okay, whatever your room number is, if you're in room one, go to room two. If you're in room two, go to room four. If you're in room four, go to room eight. So just whatever your room number is, double it. Now you've created an infinite number of spots, which is the same number as people who were in the hotel originally, right? There was an infinite number, a countably infinite number of people, but nonetheless, you can fit another countably infinite number of people into the hotel by doing this procedure. Very annoying for the guests, but nonetheless, it can be done. Paradox, because you can't fit the same number of people into a hotel when it's already full, right? Well, that's, I mean, I, I don't want to spoil the surprise for you, but yeah, you can, because infinity is super weird. So infinity plus infinity, that's infinity, same number, yeah? Bizarre, but actually when you get down to precisely defining infinity, and I won't go through the whole rigmarole of doing that, but like when you get down to precisely defining infinity, mathematically speaking, you can totally do infinity plus infinity, infinity times infinity, they just keep adding up to infinity. There are some things that you can do that don't add up to the same infinity, but yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is one where you've got all these common sense intuitions based on how regular numbers work. Like, add a number to itself, you get a different number, right? Uh, but if you add infinity to itself, it's the exact same number. It's not even a bigger infinity, it's just the same infinity. Okay, we're... We're getting fairly low on time, so let's just, let's just keep going. Uh, here's another one. It's called the Simpsons Paradox or Simpsons Reversal. This is your, these are really not paradoxes at all, right? They're just things with arguments with counterintuitive conclusions that some people sometimes call paradoxes. So a Simpsons Reversal is this thing in statistics where you can have two groups with a clear linear trend, and then you add the groups together and the trend is reversed. So that's, what's, that's what you see here. So the blue ones, the blue group, clear, linear trend, linear rising trend. The red ones, a clear linear rising trend, but when you draw a line through the com combination of the two, the trend is declining. There it is. Simpsons reversal, Simpsons paradox. This is just a weird thing that happens when you do statistics, and statistics often do counterintuitive things. So. Any worries about that? There's nothing to unravel here because it's just a fact that this is so, right? It's just a somewhat counterintuitive thing. All right, we've got a couple more interesting ones to do and then we'll call it a day. So uh, some arguments seem paradoxical, paradoxical or are paradoxical because they contain self-reference. There's a bunch of paradoxes of self-reference. The classic one is of course the liar's paradox. I always lie. Is that statement true or false? Well, if it's true, then it's false. And if it's false, then it's at least potentially true. I mean, if it's, 
If it's false, that doesn't prove that it's true, but at least is consistent with it being true. Or even worse, this statement is false. If it's true, then it's false. If it's false, then it's true. Yeah? If this statement is false, don't you argue that it's a fallacy because you're assuming that two different things have the same meaning? Which two things? I mean, like, this statement doesn't mean the statement that you're talking about. It just means that. No, it does. So in this case, assume that this refers to this, the statement that it's, so it's self-referencing, right? This, this sentence is self-referencing. Yeah? Any, any suggestions? There are people have trying to come up with solutions to this. Are there any suggestions about how you get out of this one? Or is rationality coming crashing down and we all just sort of return to, the, yeah? I think it's like you just said for I always lie. Yeah. It's just potentially true then. It's not necessarily because if you have one example of one of their sentences and it doesn't necessarily mean everything they've ever said or everything they ever will say is a lie. Good. Okay. So that's a, that's a, that's a, a nice way to deal with I always lie. Good. How about the sentence statement is false? So one of the ways people have suggested that you can deal with this is to assume that every statement contains an implicit, it is true that, right? So if you say, it is true that this statement is false, uh, you can just say, no, it's false. It's not true that it, this statement is false. Something like that? I don't know. All right, we haven't got enough time to hash through it. I want to get to one more, uh, two more. So there's two more real quick. Here's another one. The word heterological. So heterological means that a word that does not describe itself. An autological word is a word that does describe itself. I think the word cute is kind of cute. Isn't it cute? Right? So that means it's autological. It describes itself. Heterological is just the opposite. It doesn't describe itself. So is the word heterological itself Heterological. If it is, then it isn't. And if it isn't, then it is. Okay, I'm just going to leave you to twist and turn in that one, if that's all right. We're running out of time. I got one more I want to do. All right, so uh, this is Russell's paradox, super famous paradox in the history of philosophy. This brought like a whole research program crashing down. Uh, so let R be the set of all sets that do not contain themselves. The set of all sets that do not contain themselves. Is R a member of itself? If it's a member of itself, then it doesn't contain itself. But if it doesn't contain itself, then it's a member of R. So it does contain itself. The actual resolution to this was to give up on early formulations of set theory and to say, you're not allowed to just slap together any kind of set you want. So this is why they developed zermelo frankel set theory rather than naive set theory. Naive set theory says, for any property, there's a set of things that correspond to that property. And this paradox was a reason to say, slow down. You need to, you need to put more rules on what kind of sets you can build. Right? And that's the difference between naive set theory and zermelo frankel set theory, which is kind of the foundations of mathematics today. They say, well, don't, you can't just say anything's a set because you get stuff like this. Uh, there's a more intuitive version of this called the barber's paradox. So a barber shaves every man in town who does not shave himself. Does the barber shave himself or not? Barber shaves every man who does not shave himself. So if he shaves himself, then he doesn't. If he doesn't shave himself, he does. This formulation, as I've written it, exactly as I've written it, has a really easy solution. What's that? It makes sense. Sure, sure. <laughs> but, okay, so but he, does he shave himself or not? He can just not shave forever. <laughs> well, then he doesn't shave every man who doesn't shave himself. So if he doesn't shave, then he falls under the set of men who don't shave themselves, and therefore he shaves himself. Yeah? Can someone else shave him? Uh, so does he or doesn't he not shave himself? Well, no, he's, somebody else has shaved him. Yeah. So he doesn't shave himself. Oh, okay. Therefore, he should be shaving himself. 
Here's one way of getting out of this. Maybe the barber's a woman. It does say himself, but if we give, get, rid of that, get rid of that predicate. If the barber's a woman, it's perfectly possible for her to shave every man who doesn't shave herself, but not herself. Yeah. Yeah. If the barber can't, well, it's still the case that he doesn't shave himself. Yeah. If you don't grow facial hair, then you don't shave yourself. Okay. Let's call it. I see, I see your restless. Thanks, everyone. Uh, well, hopefully, we'll see you on Thursday for review.